never gone live before, so just give me a second. I'm trying to figure this out. There we go. Go away. All right, guys, so today we're here and we're going to be talking about the early fall physiology of bonsai. So what do we do? What don't we do? But most importantly, why do we do what we do and why do we not do what we do? Um, I think fall can really be considered the very first season for our trees. Um, not spring. A lot of us will think of as spring as being our first season for our trees. But the one season that we really don't want to mess up because it really has the biggest impact on the coming growing season when we go to spring, but also the health of our trees through the winter is going to be fall. So if you're going to nail one season out of the entire year, you want to nail your fall season. Um, specifically, I'm going to be talking just about our temperate trees. So we're not going to be going into tropicals or tropical preparation during winter or how to winter your tropical trees. That's an entirely completely different topic that we can go into at a different time. Um, so we're gonna be talking about our temperate trees, those that do need a degree of winter dormancy. Um, most likely we're probably gonna break this maybe into two lectures. We're just gonna see how this goes. Um, just there's a lot of information and really when we're approaching fall and what we do with our trees or don't do can be divided into two parts of fall being early fall and late fall. Um, so in the spring and through summer, hey Jay, welcome. Um, so in the spring through summer, temps are warmer, our daylights are quite a bit longer. So what type of growth are our trees focused on? Um, you can go ahead and throw out answers if you want in the chat. You can sit back and listen. If you have questions, go ahead and pop them in. They should come through and I should be able to see them right away. Um, but in the spring, through summer, our trees are really focused on that foliar growth because our daylights are long, we get a lot of sun. Hey, Hassan. And they're wanting to optimize that photosynthesizing. So with the sun bright, long daylights, they wanna put out as many solar panels as they can so that they can create and accumulate that energy. Um, but right now we're entering into fall. So what do we see happening um, in our trees this time of year? What do we see going on outside in the early fall area. Our days are generally getting shorter, sun is less intense, and our temperatures are dropping. So our trees are going to be right now over the next, depending on your zone, you know, two weeks, one to two weeks, maybe they've already started to enter it a little bit. They're going to be going into what we call that vascular growth spurt. Um, it doesn't make sense for our trees to be putting out more photosynthesizing capabilities when the day is getting shorter and they're getting less light. Um, it's just not something they do. It would really be a dumb thing for the tree to waste energy on right now. So we're going into that vascular growth spurt. Our trees are smart. They think ahead. So I say this is really the first season that our trees, for our trees, because they're actually preparing and putting in place everything they need for the growing season and for the foliar growth in the spring and in the summertime. Uh, they need to be able to support that massive spring push. So when we're talking about that vascular growth spurt and our vascular tissue, what we're really talking about with most of our trees is our branches, <laughs> got it. You know, our main trunk lines and our rooting systems. To some degree, if we're talking about like conifers and evergreens, the foliage slightly can also be considered, you know, part of that vascular growth, but they're not generally adding more foliage during the vascular growth spurt. Um, they need to put in all of those new transportation highways to support that movement of the energy in the spring from the stored energy down in the roots to get it back up and to be bigger next year because our trees grow every year they get bigger they are hopefully going to put out a big vigorous spring push and they need to have all of that new transportating highways ready for when that springtime push hits because we know that's go season the trees don't have time to put that in place before they start pushing out that energy. Buds start swelling, leaves start erupting. Um, so right now you're gonna be seeing a lot of um, exponential girth going on in your trunk. Your branches might be getting thicker and excessively also in your roots. Um, let's see, 
a lot more vacuoles in the roots. The big thing that they're going to be doing right now, especially if you live in a temperate climate with your temperate trees, is they're creating more vacuole storage in their rooting system. What that's going to do, it's going to allow them then to store more energy for that spring push. But the more vacuoles and the more energy stored in those vacuoles, it also increases that winter hardiness of that tree. So they're then more protected during the winter and safer. Um, so as a whole, when people say we're hands off most of our trees and we're not going to be pruning during the vascular growth spurt, um, why would we not want to be reducing our foliage mass right now? If you have an idea, go ahead. You can throw it out there. I'm hoping this can be like a discussion. If you have questions pop up, of course, pop them in the comments. Just gonna pause for a second for some coffee. It's the middle of the night for me. But, so if we reduce and go in and we do pruning and cutbacks, especially on our trees in development right now, if we are reducing our foliage that our tree has in the vascular growth spurt, we are reducing our tree's ability to photosynthesize, which then has a domino effect. So if we're removing the ability for our tree to photosynthesize at its max capacity, we are now reducing the ability our tree has for energy to create increased vascularity, increased trunk width, thickness, increased thickness of our branches, increase in our rooting mass, increase in those vacuoles, which then we're actually going to be shorting our tree when we go into the growing season next year. So if we're gonna reduce all the energy going in, reduce everything we have here, reduce the amount that our vascular tissue grows, we're gonna reduce the amount of energy that our tree has to put out a spring push. So we're gonna be shorting it. That doesn't mean we're not gonna get a healthy tree. It's still gonna grow, still gonna do its tree things, but you're not gonna get as much as you can if you leave your foliage alone right now during that vascular growth spurt. Um, so what do we do? I got boobs and other parts. <laughs> Blue Jay. So what do we do with our trees now during the vascular growth spurt? Um, some of the work that we can do with our trees right now, you saw me do it this last week with that for styling on that juniper, live vein cleaning. Live vein cleaning is one of the most important things you can add to your arsenal. Um, a lot of people, beginners, people more starting out, they don't necessarily go in and clean the live vein and remove those bark plates off of our scale junipers. Right now, that is a thing that we really should be doing, um, not only for aesthetics, and you might be able to say like, I don't care, I don't, I'm not interested in creating that look, but it's also at this time of year to identify the boring insects that we have in our scale junipers. Um, there's a lot of high sap movement right now through that vascular growth spurt, and the bores that they usually lay in the early spring then, this is the time, <laughs> hey there, um, this is the time that the bores are going to be visible to us and that we can identify them. And it's also the time that they're destructive to the trees. So if you have boar eggs that were laid in the spring and right now they're under there feeding and sucking all that sap out of your tree, you're not gonna be able to see something going on with your tree until that tree starts to die now in you know, a couple months down the road, especially with our junipers. It takes about two to three months for them to actually show the death and the damage in their foliage and their canopy. Um, you can't see evidence of our spores that attack our scale junipers until those spores start to leave the tree, and that's when your tree is already dead. Um, so going in, removing those bark plates, and you'll see worms that, you know, little larvae worms. They're not invisible. They're not like a spider mite. You don't have to look super hard for them. It also, removing your bark plates right now, it's going to prevent a area for those eggs to be laid when we go into next spring. Um, there's no chemicals that work for boring insects at all. <clears throat> we don't have any reason to clean the bark plates on our pines, so that's not something that we do. The boars that we see in pine trees, hinokis, um, needles, needle junipers don't actually get, and neither do hinokis, a boring insect. Um, our pines can get boring insects, but we actually do see evidence of that and the destruction created through the larvae without removing those bark plates. So you, what you're going to see is... Um, areas of sap on that trunk line and usually um, maybe some debris or dust from those boring insects and then you know you need to go in on your pine and investigate look further for that um, you can also do 
population controls. This is something I learned from um, Ryan Neal, but you've seen me use the yellow sticky tapes. Yellow sticky tapes can be very indicative of any type of flying insect. Um, not only capturing them so they can't cause you know, problems and it helps control the population, but sticky traps are great to identify if you have issues going on around your trees. Yellow sticky tapes work great for, I use them for the fungal gnats in the tropical room during the winter. Um, they work for aphids, any of those flying insects that are really focused on eating our foliage. Um, purple sticky tapes actually work for boring insects. So if you're wondering, do you have those in your area? Is that something that you need to be concerned about? I always think you should be cleaning your bark off your scale junipers, but to see if that's something you also have going on, you can also use the purple sticky tapes. Um, this is also the perfect time to do our heavy structural work, especially on our, you know, our conifers. We're not generally adding huge bends into our deciduous material, but if you are, again, this is a good time. Um, because with that vascular growth, those bends are gonna set a lot faster than if we wait, you know, for spring or we put that on and take it off, our wire off during the middle of summer and not allow it to be on there during that vascular growth spurt because that's when we get that exponential thickening of our branches, of our trunks. Um, so you just get a lot of more bang for your buck on that shorter time frame. Uh, also, it helps to cover up our mistakes. So if we're putting a big bend in a conifer or a juniper or something, and maybe we get a little bit vigorous, maybe we break it a little bit or crack it. <laughs> hey, Xavier, I'm glad to see you out there working with your junipers. Um, during the vascular growth spurt, our trees, it's probably the best time to work on those big bends because our trees can actually heal the best because that sap flow and that vascular growth is so high right now that it really, it'll, it's gonna help to heal those so your tree can recover from those, you know, breaks, tears in that cambial layer um, throughout the tree. Now, a lot of times we've heard our deciduous material to go hands off, don't prune, don't touch your deciduous material. Um, but the big question on that is, is that piece of material, is it in refinement or is it in development? So in fall, our tree's accumulating all that energy for that um, bigger, thicker branches, increased vacuole stores. Our trees that are in refinement, we're working on that fine twigging, the very small, delicate structures within that tree. We don't necessarily want a vascular thickening. We don't want coarse growth. We wanna keep it very fine. So if your tree is in refinement, you can go ahead and work on that and use that vascular growth spurt as another arsenal, another technique in your toolbox. Um, a lot of people will go in right now and they might do a 50% reduction in some of their um, medium or larger leaf tree varieties and that 50% reduction in the leaf size, they might just go through and cut out 50, you know, all of their leaves, cut them in half, decreasing the photosynthesizing area of those trees in refinement. It's then going to have a smaller surface area for photosynthesizing. So less energy is coming into that tree to create that. But in our trees in refinement are also our ones that regardless of where they hail from, their natural environment, their winter hardiness, they are the least winter hardy and they need the most protection. Yep, get a good prune on those then, Xavier. <laughs> um, so we, our trees that are in refinement, not this tree, we can go ahead and we can work on that to prevent that thickening to keep those branches finer. Um, deciduous trees that are in development. Now, those are the trees that really the very last thing we want to be doing is going in and pruning them right now. We don't want to be reducing the foliage canopy, shortening the branches. Um, we want things that are in usually that first stage, second stage of development um, to thicken, maybe elongate, allow those shoots to run out, leave them alone right now. But if you're looking at your trees or some of your trees and you're like, I need to prune this before it comes into perhaps my cold storage or my cold frame, um, I'm going to say you need to wait. Just sit back, wait, let all that foliage that's out there right now do its thing. If you missed that opportunity in that late summer pruning and you didn't get it done, we have another, 
<laughs> uh, earthquake. Me moving my chair. <laughs> I don't know. Um, but if we miss that late summer prune and we're looking at our deciduous and development, we can go in and we can very safely get another pruning done, but we're not going to do it right now. Not in our vascular growth spurt, not in our early um, fall here. We want all of that photosynthesizing to push it out. So can you guess and start thinking maybe what would be the timing if you're saying, I missed my prune, I need to go in and still prune this tree before I move it. What would be an optimal time for us to go in on deciduous? Jay. It's going to be once our leaves change color. Yeah, keep your mouth quiet. Once our leaves change color, um, and that is an indicator at that very point in that tree that we can now in late fall, coming out of that vascular growth spurt, we can go in and we can prune any of our trees that are in development, shorten the branches, put them back into a place, make it so they can fit into the cold room. Because once our leaves start to change color, it's the chlorophyll and that photosynthesizing, everything that has been stored in those leaves are being reabsorbed, sucked back into the tree, transported through all of those new transport highways that we put on, and then brought back down into the roots, into those vacuoles to store. Um, once that has changed, it's very safe to go in and cut back all of your trees that are in early development. Um, as fall progresses, we're moving into that late fall, early winter, um, some things that we notice with our tree is decreased water. And you might be noticing that already right now. I know I am. I didn't water yesterday. So I think it's probably the first time this year that I didn't actually water on a daily basis. But we're decreasing our water that's going up through our trees because the vast majority of all of our water that our trees are using during the growing months is actually to keep the tree cool. So 85% of the water that we put in our pots is for transpiration and respiration through our foliage canopy to keep the tree cool. Our days are getting shorter, temps are getting colder. They don't need to focus on that high water usage for keeping the tree cool. 15% of the water that we give is what we use for metabolic activity. Um, put the water in, carbohydrates, photosynthesizing, ATP shuffles, and it's that's all used then to create the carbohydrate that the tree actually then uses for food. Um, the amount of water that we have in the tree, in our roots, in our branches, in our trunk line, that's going to affect the temperature tolerance of our tree. So right now I have to be really watching nighttime temps going into fall. We usually get a little bit of a break of our cold right now, and then we start hitting some cold winters times. If you get a sudden break during break, a sudden temperature plunge during fall, and your trees have been sitting at 45 in the vascular growth spurt, and a big cold front moves in, and we suddenly drop to 32, that's very dangerous for the trees. That is more dangerous than them going through that natural fall process and 32 degrees in December because we still have so much water in not only our roots, but also our branches that when they suddenly freeze, that's when those ice crystals form and those structures, those vacuoles, the cell wall bursts open and that cell then dies. Um, so we have to be cogs cognizant, cognizant, I'm gonna work on that English word, you guys. Um, so let's see, we talked about the leaf color changing, chlorophys, chloroform is chloroform. Chlorophyll is gonna be reabsorbed from our leaves all the way back into our tree. And that's our trigger saying we now have, yeah, boring insects, not fun, Mike. Bad, bad. Um, They've gone down through. They are now down here in those rooting systems. All of the energy that's being loaded up in these areas, once that gets pulled down, what's happening is we're getting a high concentration of those energy molecules going down into the, um, I'll get back to that, Mike, back down into the rooting system. And we're gonna be fertilizing heavy during the fall. 
at least two applications I want to get on my trees before we actually go into, you know, winter time. When we add the solvents and all of that energy being reabsorbed down into the rooting system, what happens is the water is getting removed from those cells and it's being replaced with those solvents and that stored energy. So that's what's causing now the that winter hardiness is we're pulling that water out of those cells and now we're loading it with solvents and energy. Um, so that's gonna increase the cold tolerance and decrease the temperature at which the freezing can take place in those roots. So if you went in and you pruned your deciduous material way too early and you don't have all that energy coming down here, your tree's gonna be storing more water in the roots, which is going to then decrease its winter hardiness. Um, deciduous material, when we're working on it though in later winter, very high water mobility still in that early season. Um, branches water loaded. Once our trees have changed color, you have about two or three weeks after that point that you can get all that work done before it's actually gone into a state of dormancy. So after those leaves fall, you're safe for two to three weeks still to go in and do work. And that's when we do a lot of our structural work on our deciduous material um, because we can see that naked structure, but it's still moving enough water that it can heal and recover from those cuts that we're making. Um, conifers, much, much lower water mobility um, than a deciduous. So that's a conifer is not something that when we're going into late fall, early winter, that we want to be going in and doing major cuts for it because conifers rely very heavy on the hormones that ha has already set this late, you know, in that late fall season for its growth next year. So if we go in in early winter on our conifers or that late fall, after we see our deciduous material go through the leaf drop two to three late weeks later, so five weeks down the line, we're looking at our conifers, we wanna do cutbacks. We are removing the hormones that that conifer actually put in place to push and grow in the spring. Um, so if we prune it back, not only isn't gonna lose its cold tolerance, but come spring, it's gonna be a little bit confused and not quite know what to do. So you might not see all of your candles push out their needles. So that's just one thing to be thinking about. Right now is a great time to go in and do the conifer work and your deciduous material in refinement. And then late fall, after the color leaves change, then we can go in and do our cutbacks, do our work on our deciduous material that's in development. And for our conifers, we hands off at that time. Let's see, do I have anything else here? No. Nope. All right, so if your area or zone gets a summer dormancy, it's going to generally be zones eight, nine, 10, and maybe up. During the summer dormancy, a lot of people in those hotter zones pull the fertilization off. So once we start going into fall now and they have started to look like they're growing again and your temperatures are coming down, you're going to want to very quickly jump in and resume your fertilizing. We want to load most of our trees, except potentially those in refinement that maybe would have want to be putting out big leaves in the spring. We're, all of our trees in development, we're gonna wanna load heavy with fertilizer. Um, if like me, in my zone, 3A, 2B, we don't generally have a summer dormancy time. Or if we do, it's not to the length that we pull our fertilizer. And the reason people pull fertilizer is because if this tree is doing everything it can at 115 degrees to stay cool, use water, and we're adding solvents or salts to that soil, it's going to displace the water and that tree is going to desiccate, dry out, not be able to cool itself as easily. Um, so that's, if you've watched the fertilization episode, it goes all into that. That one's quite deep. Um, so if you were in those warmer zones, you want to jump in and resume fertilizing. I try to get at least two helpings of fertilizers on my trees before we get into winter. Also here in Northwest Wisconsin with my colder zone, I switch the type of fertilizer I'm using. Um, it's the most important time to fertilize and pound it in because not only are we supporting that metabolic process that's happening right now with that vascular growth and that vascular growth spurt, but we're also then loading those vacuoles with those solvents to increase that winter hardiness. The solvents are going to 
help through that metabolic process to displace the water out of those cells. So they aren't rupturing perhaps at 35 degrees. Perhaps they wouldn't rupture to 20 degrees to 10 degrees, depending on what that native hardiness is in that tree. Um, I will generally always use a solid slow release organic fertilizer. But again, if you watch that fertilization video, we know that organic fertilizers needs the microbes that are in that pot to break it down to make it into a usable form for that tree. And our microbes are not very active this time of year once temperatures are consistently less than 65. So you can put all the organic fertilizer slow release that you want on your tree in the fall. But if your temps are not consistently 65 and above, it's not being broken down where that tree can use it and you're just wasting that. Um, so you could at this time, if you're really focused on that microbial population and supporting it, switch to something like a organic liquid fertilizer, um, fish emulsion, dirty fish water, <laughs> um, kelp based products. For me, what I do is I do switch to a Osmocote Plus just because it does have a higher nitrogen availability for my trees in development. Um, it does, to a degree, have a negative effect. It doesn't necessarily support microbial activity in the container. Just going to pause. What do you recommend to do this summer, taking cuttings, winter, no greenhouse, no garage? We'll talk about that. If I don't hit it on it directly, it is coming up. So remind me. Um, at the end of fall, once our leaves have changed color, once the leaves have all dropped off, if you still have organic fertilizer on your soil surfaces, you do want to go in and remove that um, because it's not being broken down during our winter months to be used on the tree. That doesn't mean it doesn't break down some mold, creates a crater on the crust, interferes with that oxygen water um, in the containerized environment. So before my trees come into a cold into the cold room, I take my root rake, I clean off the surface of all my soil and it doesn't come it doesn't come in it's <clears throat> let's see during winter one of the things that or early winter into winter there's a big misnomer out there i'm probably sure you've heard it that deciduous trees don't photosynthesize during the winter so if they're coming into hey xavier i'm talking fahrenheit in the comments, if you want, why don't you pop up those translations? So you're 18 degrees Celsius. I don't know what that translation is without opening that up and looking. But if you wanna drop the Fahrenheit translations for me, that would be probably a great help for everybody <laughs> that speaks Celsius, Celsius, Celsius. Yep, 63 Fahrenheit. Um, and we wanna look at that consistently. So last week I had nighttime temps of 40, daytime temps of 80s. During the day it was sunny and 80s, so my organic fertilizer is still breaking down. It's still being used at least half the time. Um, during the summer we don't really get hot overnight, very, very rarely. So 60s are usually our nighttime temps regardless, even in the peak of our summer, especially this year. It was a great, great nighttime sleeping without having air conditioning here. But um, so they are actually still photosynthesizing. So University of Minnesota put out a very long range study. It started actually in 1957 and it was with the University of Minnesota genetics and their horticultural thing. If you just look up poplar tree photosynthesizing during winter, what they did is they evaluated and they looked at the deciduous material that was growing and still thriving in our coldest areas in Northern Minnesota and they took tissue samples throughout the winter. And what they found is our deciduous material actually still photosynthesizes during the winter and it photosynthesizes with chlorophyll in its more superficial um, trunk bark areas, especially some of the poplars and stuff, which actually will take on a green tinge in their trunk. Um, so some people say, I don't need to put lights in my cold room with deciduous material because they're not photosynthesizing. We've also commonly have accepted in bonsai that those that do use lights, even on deciduous material, those trees come out a lot better in the winter. And that is why they actually do photosynthesize. Um, we already know our conifers do, our junipers do. The key to, do I need lights? How much lights do I need? 
is going to be the temperature at which you're, if you're going to be wintering in a cold room or a cold frame, is going to be that temperature that you're staying at. So that sweet temperature for where we're going to be storing our trees is we want to keep our tree, our temps, low enough so that they're not metabolizing that stored energy that we just stored up in the vascular growth spurt. We want as much as that energy to be coming out in that spring push. Um, if our temperatures during what's supposed to be their dormant or their cold time come above 40, 42 degrees, you can measure and they have measured then metabolic activity in our tree and that tree starts sucking from those stored resources to support that metabolic activity through winter because it's not actually in a dormant state at that time. So the sweet temp where I keep my cold room at is just above 32, you know, around 33, and I target for 40. The magic number of dormancy days is going to be 40 days. They need 40 days between the temperatures of 32 to 42 degrees Fahrenheit, some say 40 degrees, but right in there, those are the dormancy hours, and we need 40 consistent days of that. If temperatures are below 32, it's actually not counted as dormancy. So even though here in northern Wisconsin, I have a six or seven month winter, the vast majority of our winter is well below freezing. January and February is very commonly negative 35 Fahrenheit. Sometimes we have a week or two of negative 45 Fahrenheit. <clears throat> we don't want our trees depleting those energy stores during winter because then they can't push out in the spring with the degree that they would be able to if they're in that dormant state. Um, so we're going to weaken, weaken them quite a bit. We want to minimize any type of metabolic activity. <clears throat> During dormancy, we talked about that earlier, is we have that increased concentration of water in the soil around that tree, but it's lower in our roots because they're loaded with those carbs and those solvents. If we start creating winter dormancy, it's gone dormant, it's done what it should, everything's where it should be in the roots, and now we have somehow in our cold room, cold frame, we have a temperature spike that's coming above 42, 43, 44 degrees. You're hitting 45 degrees. The water with that metabolic process is now going to want to move to an area with less water. So those vacuoles had not a lot of water in it. The water's around in the soil. That tree is going to start now displacing solvents and energy back out of those vacuoles and those cells and bringing the water back in. You go, oh crap, you correct it, you bring your tree back down to freezing. We have refilled all of those cells with water and now those cells are going to burst. So that's what's very dangerous and you wanna be cautious about. If you suddenly see you're getting a cold spike outside, the last thing you wanna be doing is taking that tree, if you're wintering it outside, and bringing it into your 70 degree house overnight thinking you're protecting it because what you're doing now is you are loading all of those cells in the roots with water and when you move it back outside to your 32 degree fahrenheit day right around freezing that tree is very easily and most likely going to die simply because all of those vacuoles and those cells are now going to burst because instead of being filled with those solvents that made them hardy at freezing they're now filled with water and that's going to create those ice those little ice shards, and it's going to rupture those cells. <clears throat> if we're talking ideal storage, that's a lot, that's going to depend on your zone. In my area, my zone, many people in the northern Minnesota zone where they're going up to, they're warmer than me, they're in a 3B, 4A. Um, ideally, which most of us don't have because it's very expensive, um, would be something like a greenhouse. Um, a small greenhouse can be dangerous in our area because the smaller the greenhouse, the more labile our temperatures are gonna be. And as the sun comes out during the day, it's very common for small greenhouses to heat up to 50 degrees Fahrenheit, 60 degrees Fahrenheit. But at night, hey Tony, but at night then without the sun warming that greenhouse, those temperatures are going to be generally equal to what they are outside. So if we're going to have a stable greenhouse in our area, we need to have a larger one that allows more air, higher roof system. We're going to need a heating element to support those winter temps so we're not getting too cold. And for me in my area, I need my winter cold frame for weeks and days at a time to actually be 80 degrees Fahrenheit higher than what the outside temp is. 
Um, they're also going to need to have fans in place so that we can exchange that air during the day so we can make sure that the greenhouse isn't being, um, isn't getting too hot, that we're not, you know, pushing metabolic processes to start in our tree while they're supposed to be dormant. Um, because that's not feasible, what most of us use in these colder zones, even zone fours, zone five, zone six, maybe a couple trees in zone seven, depending on how hardy the trees are that you have, we use something called cold shelters or cold frames. Um, so what a lot of people do is they'll use and purchase um, insulation that's rated to a certain degree of negative temperatures to help maintain that temperature. And maybe it's an unheated garage that they put it in. They might build a area in a corner, put some shelving units in it, put the insulation up, put some lights in there. Definitely we need temperature gauges where we're wintering our trees. Unless you're in a fairly warm winter area and your trees all stay outside, perhaps you just have to hold your trees in. You can watch your outside weather to gauge those temperatures. But if you're using any type of other <clears throat> cold frame, cold storage area, we need to be monitoring and watching those temperatures. Um, some lights put out a lot of heat. So some people in their cold rooms might see that during the day with certain types of lights, their temperatures might get too high. They need to act really quickly, especially in early winter to correct that before we get into those more freezing type temperature timings. Um, and so that we can just ensure that our trees are getting the dormant time that they need. If we only have a one or two trees that we're bringing into an area like that, what we also need to be watching is our humidity. Trees can very easily dry out and desiccate if they're in a very dry area. The more trees you have in a cold room or a cold frame, the more stable that humidity is and the more higher it is, especially if you have evergreens. Um, I actually use a cold room. It's a full bedroom space in the house upstairs. <laughs> hey, bald yeti. We'll see what, the, see what the school sends home for her naughty note today. She provides comic relief, but I'm not sure it's always funny for the teacher. Um, I use a cold room upstairs. I have two windows, I have grow lights, I have a fan that I can put in the winter. The hardest times I have to regulate temperatures and keep them cool is in early winter when our outside temps are maybe just sitting around freezing, 30, you know, and we're getting like daytimes that are 30 degrees Fahrenheit, right around that freezing mark. Those are the hardest times that I have keeping my that room cool. Once we move into January and temps outside are cold, I need to do very little. That temp consistently stays at rough, you know, roughly that 36, 37 degree Fahrenheit without me doing any type of action. The other things our trees really need during winter is air movement. Um, especially the smaller, more enclosed space you are, you wanna be more cognizant, that's that English word I'm gonna work on, of supplying air movement. Not only does that decrease any risk that we have of fungal issues, but it helps to rotate our high heat rising with cold. So some people's cold rooms and cold frames and things that they have built to winter their trees, they're gonna get very hot at the top. Maybe they'll have a 20 degree swing between the three foot top shelf and the bottom shelf. So the top shelf could be sitting at 32 degrees and the bottom shelf could be sitting at 52 degrees, or other way, 32 degrees on the bottom shelf, 52 degrees on the top shelf. That's a big issue, that's a big swing. That can be fixed if we are blowing our hot air back down. We need something to put air movement at the top of our colder fr frames usually. Um, as long as you can understand cold tolerance and that metabolic cycle and what that tree needs, it's very easy then to think about what kind of safe place that you might be needing to, su <clears throat> to supply your trees, your trees with. Um, some people, zone seven, zone eight, they're very likely gonna be able to keep the vast majority of all their trees outside using a process that we call of healing in or creating a healing in bed. Um, big things to watch out for is you want to make sure that you have a windbreak area set up for your trees because wind is a big killer during winter for most of our trees outside for us that do get winters. Um, so what a lot of people will do is they'll pick a space. <clears throat> we don't actually generally want it on the sunniest side because again, that can cause that freeze-thaw cycle. 
um, to a lesser degree if you're in a very cold area and your temperatures are generally going to stay very cold. It's not generally going to warm up enough to spike metabolic activity. But if you're starting to peak up there in, you know, some of your warmer winter zones, that might be an issue. And so you might want to actually have your tree on what's a colder side, a less sunny side to maintain those winter dormancy times. <clears throat> um, a lot of people will commonly then, if they're going to heal in, they'll create what's called a healing in bed or garden. Um, maybe some two by fours stacked up, nailed in using power tools. Yeah, that's, you're lucky, Xavier. You can bed in most of your stuff. So that is, that is quite lucky. You don't need to monitor and do a whole lot of work and, you know, micromanaging of your trees during winter. But they'll create an area with two by fours and cognizant. Yes, if you write it out, and if I keep that word written out, I can probably say it right each time. Cognizant. Keep conscious thought of. Um, but create the, the bed area. You can place your trees in those areas. Also be aware of what ceramics you're going to be wintering outside. Are they cold tolerant themselves? Are they going to crack? Are they going to burst open? You don't want to be losing ceramics. So uh, that's going to depend on what, what cone the ceramic is fired to. Um, some other things that you can do that is mulch up around your tree using things like bark mulch, leaf debris, creating a warmer environment as those are breaking down around the tree. That's going to help maintain that warmth around the rooting system. The other thing people can do is maybe they don't have enough trees where they need a cold shelter, a cold room, a cold frame, but they have very cold winters like we do, is you can buy, you want to look for seedling mats, but you want to look for seedling mats that have a low temp setting. Some of them only have temp settings that start at 60 degrees. We don't want to keep our roots at 60 degrees. So you're going to need to look for a seedling mat that has a temp setting that can be set at 33 degrees Fahrenheit. It usually has an oxygen, you know, an oxygen probe. No, no, it was a long night at work. We use lots of oxygen probes. A temperature probe. And what that seedling mat will do is it's going to keep the roots at 32 degrees. The temperature gauge will go into the pot and it will measure what the temperature is within that pot. So it's very accurate. It's going to kick on if it notices that that's dropping below you know, freezing. Maybe you want to set it at 35, 34, just to have a little extra cushion room. Um, if you have one or two trees, it's a great thing then to use if in bringing your tree into like an unheated garage. Place it in a styrofoam, you know, container. Leave the top open. Make sure that we're getting air movement and putting that seedling mat between the styrofoam and that potted environment. Because um, if you only have one or two trees, it's not necessarily going to be feasible, nor are you going to want to actually build like a cold shelter, a cold frame using, R2, you know, that R2 rated insulation um, and getting into adding all the other things that you need to do with a cold frame or a cold shelter. Before our trees go into the cold shelter, the other thing we want to think about now we removed all the fertilizer off, but would be using something like a dormant spray. So you can use a, for a dormancy spray, they have oil-based products. Neem oil is commonly used for a dormant spray. I personally don't use neem oil. I know a lot of people have good results with it. It can be phytotoxic, especially to a lot of our evergreens because how neem oil products work as both an insecticide, as a dormant spray, as a treatment for a tree, is they work through suffocation. But in especially our pines and our junipers, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> what it also does then is it can cause some suffocation of those um, respiration cells that are in those needles of those trees. So if you're applying a neem oil, just be careful. It can also cause some phototoxicity. Um, dormant spray of choice that's been tested, it's been used for a very long time, would be a lime sulfur spray where you have the lime sulfur and you mix it with water, you spray your trees. Downside is it's going to leave a white residual. That's what it, it that's just what it does. Um, the reason we're using a dormant spray isn't to remove an active problem or an active infestation or active buds that we 
bugs, not buds, active bugs that we see on the tree. It's because in that early winter time when we start bringing our trees into our cold rooms when our temperatures outside are maybe hitting, you know, 27 degrees Fahrenheit, it's to prevent issues when we come out in the spring. Granted, nobody wants to be bringing bugs into their living space, especially if you're using a living room, an area, you're not gonna use your living room. I meant my bedroom, the bedroom. But spores go dormant, bugs go dormant during this time. And while they're dormant, they're going to then wake up in the spring. So dormancy spray is being used to prevent those fungal infections that we get in the spring. The fungal infections that we get in the spring are set during the fall time. How cool is a cold room? Not less than 32 degrees, but we definitely don't want to be going over 40 to 42. There's a sweet spot and we need 40 days consistently of that. Above 42, trees go into metabolic activity. Just answering a chat question here, guys. You're like, where'd that come from? Um, if we're talking about what trees are we gonna be putting into a cold room, what trees are we gonna be putting into a cold frame, what trees are gonna be leaving outside? University of Washington, you can look it up, but they did actually this very huge in-depth study of hundreds of tree types and the temperature at which that damage occurs in their roots and that tree would die. Um, so that's something very useful. So to know how am I gonna winter my tree, we need to know what the native environment that came from. What is that tree's hardiness level in the native environment? If it's in a pot, it's already five to 10 degrees, depending on the tree type, less winter hardy. Because most of those studies that we have saying, how hardy are they? That's gonna be related to how hardy are they in the natural environment? How hardy are they in landscape? Basically, how hardy are they when they are planted in the ground? Everything that we do in bonsai is reducing the hardiness of our trees. So in the early lecture, we talked about our trees in refinement are our most delicate trees, most prone to winter death because we have created such fine rooting systems, fine branches. Most of our trees, if they're going to die in the winter, it's going to be because the roots died. So that University of Washington study actually studied at what temperatures do the roots die on various trees. Um, so if you're asking, is this tree winter hardy? Do I have to do actually extra protection? Am I not gonna keep it outside to 28 Fahrenheit? Am I gonna be proactive and safe bringing it in at 35 degrees Fahrenheit? It's, that's gonna be a personal decision that you make because you already know how that tree is doing. Um, if we look at, I have a really crappy tree. I think it's outside though. I'll get it later. Um, so and pines, our pines are generally gonna be our most winter hardy trees. That's because we've already talked about they have a much lower water content in their vascular storage than compared to our deciduous trees. So as a whole, the only tree that I actually had survive attempting to winter some trees outside last winter was a red pine and was a willow tree. I actually had four percumbens in grow buckets recently received late fall last year in a workshop as excess trees that I didn't have room for. So I left those outside. They were all protected the same. They were all in large grow buckets. The junipers all actually died. And you'll hear in beginner forums, on beginner bonsai groups, everybody says they can stay outside in their hardy to 45 below Fahrenheit. Not excessive, that's not exactly true. When I went in to examine why did they die this winter and I pulled them out of the bucket, what I realized was these junipers had been at the nursery very recently potted up. So they were in very large grow buckets, just like the red pines, just like the willow I have. And the top, only the top surface of those buckets contained roots. Um, so that's why those trees were susceptible. That's why those trees died. They actually didn't have roots in an area that was able to sustain them. So those roots just died off. Our deciduous material, it is more prone to death and damage along our branches, again, due to the higher water content. But you can actually get full tree death in your deciduous material if, you, if your branches die off. Because if you've left them outside 
they shouldn't have been left outside it's too cold for that tree and winter comes and we get dieback through all of a young deciduous material in development on our branches come spring those roots are going to start pushing up energy they don't have anything to push because the branches and the buds died you might get a little bit of maybe a bud swell or something but because they push out all of that energy and they're not pushing out leaves they don't have a way to reaccumulate energy to continue growing um the other thing we'll see in our deciduous material if we did not winter it appropriately and it died is root death just like what we could get with junipers and other conifers elongating species and if the roots in any of those trees die we may not know that right away in spring because we still have stored energy that's in the vascular trunk and those branches that tree might have just enough stored energy to start bud pushing and you might think your tree lived but then you're starting to get weeks into spring those buds swelled they never did anything further than swell and that's because they didn't have any further energy because their roots were dead that part of the tree was gone all they had used up was that stored energy in the vascular areas of the trunk and the branches but they couldn't continue a push they had exhausted that um same thing in our junipers we're not going to see uh, yeah absolutely xavier it's very easy to see in our junipers, we're generally not going to see that they died in winter until three or four weeks after. It might be the beginning of June here before we notice that a juniper died. And that is, again, going to be because a juniper or an evergreen, because it keeps its foliage, it has a lot more storage area and resources. So that juniper is going to push in the spring. It's going to look great. It might look great for three or four weeks come June you start noticing color change. That's because that tree has pushed and it sustained everything that it had stored in its um, foliage canopy as an evergreen and in its vascular system. But once that has pushed and it's trying to send things back down to the roots to say, hey, we need to reaccumulate more energy. We need to create more energy so we can feed the canopy. The roots are like, we're not here anymore. We died, we died two, three months ago. I can't give you any energy. So that's why we're not going to see that initial dieback in our junipers for at least three weeks, maybe four weeks after things have started to spring push. Um, so if you see your junipers are suddenly losing color very rapidly and dying that first week in June, it's not something that you did at that time in June. They actually died during the winter and they just, their roots died and they did not have a way to continue to feeding the tree. Um, if we're going to talk about when do we bring our trees in? How long do we leave them outside? The best thing you can do is leave your trees out as long as possible. So the longer we leave our trees outside, elevated initially, air movement, photosynthesizing in the sun, we've already talked about, we already know deciduous trees absolutely do photosynthesize during winter. They photosynthesize through their bark. Proven studies have already been done throughout the US in our coldest areas um, the better than they can do during the winter because they're continuing to store energy and to also maintain winter hardiness with that continued photosynthesizing process um, if we talk about the threshold then of which trees freeze it's going to depend on that tree variety our trees might be and very safe at 35 degrees everything is staying out on the benches at that point i have a very few trees that I'm not going to allow to get to 32 degrees, but the vast majority will stay outside to about 28 degrees Fahrenheit. So we're watching our temperatures. We start seeing that we're hitting 32 degrees. The first thing that we can do, especially if we're having 32 degree nights or around that freezing mark, but our days are still quite nice, is move the trees to the ground. So just like when you're going over an overpass on the highway, what's the first area that freezes is going to be that overpass, that suspended area up, you know, above that higher elevation point. Those areas ice over, they freeze because they have that increased air movement, wind going through that area. So at 33, 34, 35, you might wanna be proactive, start sticking your trees on the ground. 
Contact with the ground is also going to help maintain a warm environment in that containerized environment. Um, the ground temperatures are generally going to be six to seven degrees warmer at the level of the ground than two, three feet up on a bench. So stick your trees on the ground to start with. 32 degrees, most of them are going to be just fine. Um, newly collected material, like Jay and I have some oaks that are extremely difficult to collect. I have two oaks that are, um, they do have leaf push, but they probably have a total accumulated of four leaves pushing after collection. Those trees are going to be super susceptible and lead a lot more protection a lot earlier during winter. They are not going to be at all winter hardy, even though they are native and collected here. Those are trees that are gonna come into the cold room at 35 degrees. I have one younger maple. I don't know what's going on with it, but it also looks like crap. It went through the spring growth push. Summer looked fine, but it just kind of halted. So it's a concern because if your trees are not growing during a grow season, they're dying. We might not know it yet or why, but they are dying if they're not growing during the grow season. Um, yeah, don't know what's going on with it. It's just the one thing it's behaving badly. I just gonna continue to water it correctly and see what happens. Um, I am suspicious that maybe it was being overwatered because it had a high content of organic soil in it. And I may have just treated it as like all my other trees that are in bonsai soil and watered it every day. <laughs> so that's the only thing I can come up with, but um, that tree is gonna come in a lot earlier. My struggle outside is getting too cold. Arctic, Arctic entry weight isn't getting cold enough. I don't know what the Arctic entryway means. Is that like a wind stream? Tell me more about what your temperatures are doing and maybe we can jump in and give some ideas then. Um, <clears throat> so we have to be able to recognize our trees that are gonna be more cold susceptible to cold damage that we're going to protect earlier and not allow them to get as cold. Um, junipers have their strength in their foliage. Hardiness though of a juniper comes from its tap root. Our junipers that are in bonsai containers, they do not have a tap root. If you have your juniper in a bonsai container, it does not have a tap root. As soon as our junipers have moved from that big grow bucket, we've chapped off that tap root or we collected that juniper. It is not cold hardy anymore. So those that say junipers can stay outside to 45 below zero Fahrenheit, it's not true. They can stay out to 45 below Fahrenheit if it has a tap root and it's planted in the ground. Um, they have very fine roots in that container, vastly, vastly decreasing that winter hardiness. If we're going to be talking about elongating species, that's going to be our spruce, our firs, our larches. I don't have one yet, but I think I might be getting one. Um, hemlock, cedars, the dawn redwoods, um, they're considered an elongating species, even though they're a deciduous conifer. Negative 45 Fahrenheit. Put a question with that. I don't know what you mean, Xavier. Um, they are, their vascular system is what gives them their hardiness. So you can look at a tree and say right now, is my tree winter hardy? How much foliage do I have on my tree? Um, how much foliage does it have in the winter time right now? Through that vascular growth spurt. If it doesn't have a lot of foliage, we already know negative 45. Fahrenheit, Xavier. Junipers in their natural environment planted in the ground with a tap root are cold hardy to negative 45 Fahrenheit, not 45 plus. <laughs> um, deciduous, we already talked winter death. We can see that occur actually from the canopy if we lose all of our branches and our buds and they don't have anything to push out to reaccumulate energy. Um, a deciduous is going to be more susceptible to cold death in its branches compared to our conifers because it does carry a higher amount of water in those vascular tissues. Um, maple trees, significant taper in refinement, fine branches are finer the branches, the more susceptible they are going to be to cold death. If you're creating a tree and we're set on branches in bonsai for artistic styling, the last thing we wanna be doing is losing branches. Maybe it's not as a big of a deal if you have a tree in early development. Um, <clears throat> make sure I hit everything. Yep, 
So once we get to 32 degrees Fahrenheit, we have a gradual, generally a decline of temperatures. Once our leaves change color and they drop, our hardiness actually is now generally gonna be around 28 Fahrenheit. So that's why I say the vast majority of us will leave our trees outside to harden off to 28 Fahrenheit, unless we recognize right now in that fall season that this tree isn't as hardy because it doesn't have a lot of foliage mass on it. Those are ones that are going to be brought in and protected much earlier. Um, we can start seeing, even in our junipers, they do start to do a little of a color change. They might take on a dusky purple hue, and that's, again, because that chlorophyll in those um, needles are being reabsorbed into the tree. It leaves the carotenoids behind, and that's what gives it that purplish blush. Some might take on a slight bronzing color, and that's just because the keratin that's left behind in that growth area. Um, do we have any specific questions about things we should possibly do with trees based on your zones, go ahead and put them in the chat. But for me here, 32 degrees Fahrenheit, as long as they are healthy and have lots of photosynthesizing going on during the fall, they're going to be put on the ground. Decreases the airflow, increased warmth from the ground. Um, hardy species in big buckets that maybe have an extensive rooting system, big foliage mass, they're going to be fine on the ground actually till we get in the single digits. Um, so if you have a native tree, you know you got a ton of rooting in a large bucket, it's going to be okay to those single digits. If your temperatures as your lows very rarely are going to get below 10 degrees, it might be okay for you to leave those trees out all winter long. Maybe have a blanket or something available that you could wrap them up if you're going to get a sudden drop in that. Um, so what kind of work would we do in wintertime? A lot of things that we are going to be doing in that early winter time is going to be preparing for spring. So I make sure my soil is sifted. The last thing I want to be doing when it's cold outside, when I start repotting, is to be outside sifting soil. Um, you know, I start buying pots. This is a horrible time to be buying trees that haven't been in your area and used to your acclimated zone. Um, let's see. We remove the wire. If we've gone through that vascular growth spurt, we may want to remove our wire if it's starting to bite in, if it's done its work. So then things are ready just to push in the spring. We might want to be adding some wire to our deciduous trees after those leaves have dropped. The safest point, especially if you're not real comfortable with wiring, is going to be using aluminum. It's still going to be putting that wire on in that time when those leaves have hit peak color and we still have that water movement. Because if you go in and wire and you're maybe a little sloppy with your wiring or a little robust, um, putting the wire on while a tree is in full winter dormancy, if it cracks, if it breaks, it can't recover and it can't heal. Um, you can, if you didn't get your live vein work done and remove your barks, you can go ahead and do that. What we're not going to do while our tree is in full dormancy is we're not going to initiate any big styling or bending because it can't heal from that. It can't compartmentalize those injuries and it will very easily snap off. But I think I have everything out there that I wanted to say about fall care, fall physiology, both early fall and late fall. Um, we could look at some trees. So... Ain't he cute? I don't think we've seen this one before, probably ever recently. But this is a little boxwood tree. Um, boxwoods, depending on the type or the variety, they have very, very different winter hardiness. You can get a green gem bonsai boxwood. Those are actually cold tolerant to zone three. Or you can get a Kingsville or a Japanese boxwood, which are not nearly as cold tardy, hardy. Um, this is a little mim tree. It's in refinement. So right now, this time of year, I am actually going to go in, I'm going to chop off this branch. We are not use, wanting to thicken anything in here. We don't want any exponential growth going on here in our vascular structure because the structures need to be very tiny. Cute, right Mike? We want those structures to stay very tiny and fine and we need to really watch that the smaller our tree is because it can very easily get way too thick and out of proportion for the trunk and the size of that tree that we are trying to create. This is a Kingsville. 
it's had a had a journey this year um this is a tree that's also in refinement but it's also recovering it had to have large portions removed this spring because it did get hit with a volutella blight which can boxwood can be very prone to in addition if we look at this branch right here this branch had the unfortunate event in the beginning of June of for somehow becoming completely cracked off and removed from this tree. So it was approach grafted, cleaned up back onto this tree and bound at that time. We are now three months out and it is adding new growth. But just because this tree is in refinement doesn't mean that I'm going to go in and prune this because going through that vascular growth spurt, we want as much energy in this area as we can. Now I can go in and I can remove and do pruning and cutbacks on this tree in refinement to keep my structures fine, small, that small, fine twigging in the other areas of the tree. But I would stay hands off on this, especially during the vascular growth spurt, because that's going to be time this branch is going to heal the most. Um, so far, that approach graft on that is looking absolutely great. If this had failed, we are now three months down the line, we would see evidence of that already. We would not have new growth and we would not still have green because this tree being a evergreen and a boxwood, it still has just like our deciduous material, a lot of water movement in that tree. So that's something that we can consider when we look at our trees. He's doing great. So this is a little Chinese elm. It is in refinement. This is a tree though that we're not going in and doing work on at this time until we get the loss and the drop of our leaves because this was a air layer removed and we wanna be photosynthesizing and getting all of those new roots created this time of year. So this though a tree in refinement is one that I would choose to not because it's a new air layer this year. Probably have to this big beast that is overtaking with these three foot, four foot long shoots here. This is a tree that I obviously need to go in and do a pruning on before I move it into a cold room or it's gonna take up 25% of that space just with all of these excessive long shoots everywhere. Um, very early development. So this is a tree that we would go in, we're hands off right now in that earlier vascular growth stage but once the leaves change color, that chlorophyll's been reabsorbed into, tree, into the tree, that is our cue that we're going to jump in now and we are going to get those cutbacks done on those trees um, because they are not photosynthesizing anymore so we can get rid of as many of those branches and cut back to what we want. Um, doop -a -doo. This is native maple wrap. This is one that we will hands off now. There's nothing for us to do late fall. We're developing our primary trunk lines. It's going to drop and shed its leaves. We don't have any branching to worry about. This one's just gonna let go. It's gonna, just gonna be until we go to spring next year. Um, so once you understand the things that are happening during fall, early fall and late fall, it's gonna help you decide, walk through and look at your trees. Um, the raft. Ma'am, I can't say that first word. This one? This one's a native red maple, sugar maple, sweet maple. We do um, maple syrup tapping, maple syrup trees here. So this was one that I found laying down underneath a boulder. Early development with those long shoots. That's a flowering crab apple. This one? This is actually a crab apple variety and it has turned into a massive jungle. Um, are you saying the one before that? Oh no, the crab apple. Yeah. So this spring, if you watch the early development first stage, this crab apple <laughs> tree, the entire tree was about this big this spring. It was a floppy whip that did not have enough strength to stand upright. And this is what it's, this is what it's done this grow season. 
it's rewarded us with good man because of good management. <laughs> um, the tree I hate the absolutely most because it is heavy. This is what I want to part with. So this is a Japanese maple. Oh my gosh. This is a tree that we would not want to do any cutbacks because our primary branch development in relation to how beefy and huge this trunk is, it's got a nine inch Navari. We need to increase the thickness of this to put that in proportion. So this is a tree that we would hands off until the leaves change color. It's been reabsorbed into the tree and potentially even then our leaves drop. If we compare this Japanese maple to the Chia Pet one, we haven't seen it for a while. This is another variety of Japanese maple that creates a very small leaf with very tiny inner nodes. And this is being developed as a maple tree that's gonna be about yay high. So this is one that right now I am going to go back in. I'm going to shorten and cut these length, these um, branches back. I'm not gonna go in and, yeah, Fern Gully, absolutely, Mike. I'm not gonna be going in on this tree and doing a 50% leaf reduction size because it's not necessary. These leaves are so tiny. They're like the size of my pinky fingernail. Um, but if I was saying I want this tree as my final vision to look like that big beefy maple, that's not work I would be doing right now. So keep in mind what you're wanting your tree to look like and at what is my trunk the thickness as I want. Do my branches need to be thicker? In this case, we need to keep these branches thinner, so I don't want them thickening, which is why we're gonna go in and reduce, cut back, cut back the Chia Pet Maple. Um, I did remove quite a bit of the foliage this year between spaces just to get some spaces because it puts out such tiny leaves and short internodes that you actually can't even see between the levels of the leaves that it puts out. Oh. And the last one here, we have the bigger Chinese elm also in refinement. You can also have areas of your tree like we talked about with that boxwood that we're maybe doing different things with. So if I want a new branch maybe coming off and develop a new primary branch, you may have a branch that you want to run so it can thicken and catch up. Meanwhile, you go in and you cut back and you're doing all your pruning to keep everything in that finer structure and that refined shape. Um, so that's just different work that we can think of as we're going into winter. Whoa. Crab apple. It stinks. But I think that's all that I have for today, you guys. Um, if there's, is there any questions that I didn't hit on that you want further clarification? Just gonna give a few seconds in case someone's typing up a specific question. How's your Fridays going? Hey Jay, when is your show? Yeah, go get your washing off the line, Xavier. It's raining outside here. Let's look. But Whoops. Yep, thanks, Xavier. But whoops. Still trying to figure out what these buttons are on the live spring. Bye. All right, so if there's no other questions. Yeah. Thanks, Mike. They're coming along all their own time. I do need to rehome this one all the trees every time I walk past that one. <laughs> it's going to be an upcoming video. Stuff I have that is, I'm tired of watering and I don't want to water or roam through winter. Maybe that'll be a giveaway. Maybe I'll pull out all the trees that I do want to part with. And I think we're like 100 subscribers away from hitting that 1,000 subscriber mark. And so maybe the 1,000 subscriber giveaway is going to be, you get to pick which tree you want from the trees that I do want to part with. Um, I am focusing more on 
So my other tree is coming along higher in development. I don't like propagating. I don't like baby, baby trees. It's not to say I don't do it, but like right now I probably have 20 Benjamina cuttings and I only want to keep two or three of my Benjaminas in my collection. Um, beefy here. Uh, I have a trio that's a really nice spruce trio that it just doesn't, it's just not my, my favorite. Um, everybody has their different styles. I have learned that I do not like sumo trunks. That's another reason I don't like this maple. It's heavy. It's got a massive sumo trunk, not interested in it. Hey Mike, whatever cuttings you want that you've seen on my trees, let me know. I would be happy to if it's something that I can cut or potentially would do an air layer off of, I would be happy to send you anything. And that goes true for anybody. Um, yeah, I'm happy to propagate something up and send it out or say, hey, I actually do have that that I don't want and send it out. I'm never looking really to make money. <laughs> but um, become really more selective with the trees I want to work with, with the styles I want to develop. And... Just those trees that you look at and you're like, I just love that tree. That Jabotacaba, my Shimpaku junipers, my procumbens, like I love junipers. Um, that air layer Chinese elm, love that tree. But, oh, you're too sweet. Not rocking. Um, I may have been a little stuttery, Mike, and maybe a little redundant during this because I did work a 3P to 3A shift last night and it was a, it was a hopping. Yeah, the big maple. Send me an email so I can remember. ccmso12 at yahoo.com. I'll keep that on the burner. I think maybe we will do it as a giveaway for 1,000 subscriber giveaway. Um, I'll pull out all my trees that I'm not necessarily wanting to keep and continue watering. And if there's something that meets your fancy. If you're international, maybe I'll pull out my pots and stands and you can take a pick from some of those. <laughs> um, trees don't go international shipping, just doesn't work that way. But anyways, I was thinking it might be a little redundant, a little stuttery, because um, I worked 3P to 3A. I get home, tuck in, fall asleep around 5.30 in the morning. So I got my three hour nap. So I might be slightly still under the influence of Benadryl, melatonin, NyQuil the slurry I make to fall asleep when most people wake up then. So, all right, I'm going to say goodbye then. I'm going to call it quits. If you have things you want to add on, drop them. Go ahead in the comments after this video pops up and I'll get to them there. So I hope you guys are having fun and of course, have fun with your bonsai.